The state policymakers have to have, um, they have to have the workforce for the businesses that are there. And they know that if they're not providing a workforce that's well-educated that has the credentials they need, then businesses are going to go elsewhere. Lene, good to have you here. Uh, you're the Vice President for Social Policy and Politics at Third Way. That's right. And uh, more importantly, at least at this moment, uh, you have, are in the middle of this partnership with us around uh, this effort at elevating college completion. That's right. It's our first time working together on something education related. So let's talk about elevating college completion. Mm -hmm. What the heck are we, what the heck do we mean? What is college completion? Well, I think when you ask most people what the problems are in our higher education system, they mostly talk about it being expensive. They say college costs have gone up and it uh, isn't sustainable for middle class family to pay those costs. But what people don't talk about is actually we have a different problem within our higher ed system, which is there's lots of people starting college and then not completing that degree. So they might take out the loans or um, spend the time that they have invested to get par partially through that degree and never walk out with anything. It makes them unable to pay back those loans and not really um, getting any of the benefits of higher education in the first place. Now you and I wrote a piece for The Hill talking about the college dropout problem. So mm -hmm. How big a problem is this? Well, at four-year universities, it's about one in two that drop out once they've started. So it's basically a coin flip to see whether or not you're going to succeed once you enroll. It's even worse at two-year colleges, even though you might think it would be better since it takes less time to complete, but it's about 38% at two-year colleges that actually go on to complete their degree. Um, and that is a huge drag on the economy. We, there's some estimates that it's about a, a half a trillion dollar drag on our economy. Um, and it also really is a problem for those students that you know are starting wasting that time and money and then walking out with nothing. And for the taxpayers who are lending them money. That's which, right. Uh, but now the crotchety grandfather in me <laughs> immediately listens to us talking about this and says, well, wait a minute. Are we saying that everybody who walks in the door of a college should get a diploma? Yeah, and I think that especially in higher education, that's a lot of people's reaction is maybe that person shouldn't have completed or maybe it was the student's fault that they failed out. Um, we do a lot of public uh, opinion research on this and people always say, well, you know, in K-12, if someone fails, it's probably the teacher's fault or the school's fault. But in higher education, they blame it on the student. They say, well, that person probably drank too much or went to too many frat parties and decided to fail out. I think a lot of those folks work as RAs. Right? <laughs> that might have been their experience of higher education. Um, but I think when we look at at universities that have, um, or community colleges, or any institution that has one in 10 students graduating, you realize that's really a more systematic problem than a particular student. And we're still, even if there's a one in 10 completion rate, encouraging people to take out loans to go to those schools, and we're giving federal taxpayer dollars and Pell dollars to those schools, and we just don't think that that's a particularly good use of money. In the K-12 space, we ask for a lot for the federal money that we give out, and you might say way too much for the federal money that we give out, but in higher ed, we say here's a big check, and then we don't really ask for any results in return. You know, and bringing in kind of this K-12 piece, right, we, we've seen version of this movie before. <laughs> we were worried that schools weren't doing right by kids back in 2001. Congress passed the No Child Left Behind Act. Uh, there's been a lot of concern in some of the year, in the years since that schools became too focused on the things that were being measured, reading and math, um, at the expense of other stuff. Mm -hmm. So if we start talking about elevating college completion, mm -hmm. how do we make sure that we're not talking about this in a way that encourages colleges to just hand out diplomas like Pez dispensers? Yeah. I'm really excited about the five academics that we had right on this topic because I think each of them tackled that in kind of a nuanced way and added a different component to it. But um, really, it means that you can't just focus on completion. You can't just focus on it getting a degree. You also need to figure out what is the value of that degree. And so a lot of folks would use um, post-enrollment earnings as one metric that you should take a look at if that if you're graduating and then not able to earn more than say an average high school graduate then it's probably not a very good degree um, people also look at your ability to repay the loans because that's the risk to the taxpayer is that we're giving you loans and you're not able to pay it back and it also means you probably haven't found a good job and had the payoff you hoped if you can't pay back those loans so having some kind of a multiple um, outcomes focus I think is is really important here because we don't want to create especially with such a um, huge amount 
amount of federal dollars, $130 billion going to higher ed every year. It's a huge cudgel that if we, um, if we make it too simplified in terms of um, what we're asking schools to do, they're going to react in ways that we don't really want them to. I mean, I think that's, you know, in our letter prefacing each of these papers, you know, I think we try to take pains to say, look, we're not saying that 100% of people who start college should finish. Right. I don't know that it's even 70 or 80%, but in a lot of these places, it's probably substantially higher than it is today. Right. And one of the things these academics we asked to write to do is talk about some of the things that policymakers can do or that mm -hmm. institutions can do that seem to help hardworking students actually finish mm -hmm. without lowering the bar. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about a couple that really resonated for you? Sure. I think that there's been a lot of focus lately on um, what what has kind of a funny name, but I think has worked really well called intrusive counseling. It's not something that I particularly want to sign myself up for, but um, uh, these kind of um, more invested um, kind of holistic looks at a student's experience when they come in and um, assigning them a counselor that then would help them make sure they're making um, the right choices about classes, that they're going to um, be on time, that they're going to persist, and that they can fill out their financial aid forms and all of those other things. Um, just having that person have a one-stop shop for all of those questions, that I think has been really effective at, um, it's been effective at the, um, at the CUNY schools, it's been effective at other places. Um, Georgia State's been doing a lot of really Really interesting work and is um, is experimenting with these kind of micro grants because what we've seen is people might drop out because they have um, you know they have a car expense they their car breaks down or they're um, they have you know a short term um, uh, kind of lack of funds that then they have to go and pick up more hours at work and having just really small loans that they could do. How really small? How much basis. are we talking about? Um, I think the average at the Georgia State one is like $900. So it's, um, you know, compared to how much you're taking out for overall for your higher education, it's it's pretty small. And it, um, it then allows people to cover those unexpected expenses and stay in school that kind of get over that hump that might have otherwise encouraged them to drop out. Um, the one I was the most surprised about was um, this paper that Mesmond Destin wrote around kind of psychological factors and how that impacts um, whether someone completes. And particularly for students that might feel that they don't belong at an institution, whether that's because they're low income or first generation or a student of color, um, we've seen these interventions really be effective where even if you just take an hour long um, kind of course or online survey around um, a growth mindset or around grit and overcoming, um, you know, different difficulties that you might face, we're seeing a really big bump in people's completion. So I think there's small interventions that schools could do if they felt they should invest in that um, and that policymakers could um, kind of incentivize the schools to take up in a way that isn't necessarily mandating that every single school does exactly the same thing. And I mean, some of what I hear you talking about then out of the papers is they're not saying that we should necessarily punish institutions for not getting people through the degree, but you're talking about strategies that help students who are putting the work in. Because, I, I mean, it's funny, like when I relate to my own experience, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I came from a single parent household, but we were, you know, very, very comfortably upper middle class or mm -hmm. middle class. And I, I don't think about when I had car trouble that it would put me on the verge of dropping out. So can you talk a little bit about kind of some of maybe the demographics of the students yeah. that some of these papers are focused on? Yeah, I think it's it's interesting because usually the policymakers we're talking to and their staff are a very particular kind of people that have had a very particular kind of higher education experience. And so um, one of the things that you have to realize is that the student population is really different than it used to be. That um, There are a huge proportion of non-traditional students, whether that's because they're older or because they have kids or because they're going back to school later, they're not... Um, um, first time students um, or you know there's lots of different ways that you could not be the 18 year old in an Ivy League Ivy colored building um, but the those folks might need a little bit more help and, and might need different resources than you know the staffer on the hill who went to Yale and then you know their biggest concern is their 
um, you know, sheer weight of their Georgetown graduate degree loans. <laughs> um, you know, that's not the average higher education experience <laughs> in right. the country. Right. Um, and so these um, these papers are really focused on what is the more average ex experience of folks, um, which you know almost half have one of these characteristics of making them kind of non-traditional in in a certain way. Um, and I was a first generation college student in the era before the internet was really as you know uh, prolific as it is now. Um, and my parents didn't know how to you know help me decide where to go to school. They didn't know how to help me figure out what schools had good outcomes to go to for students like me. Um, you know, I, I went and visited schools that mailed me stuff after I took the PSAT. So that doesn't seem like a particularly good strategy. Clearly, I <laughs> persevered. But um, I think for students um, that, that are like me or, um, you know, kind of encountering some of these systems for the first time, they need um, just a little more help to in order to get there. And they're willing to put in the work to do that. But we just need to figure out how to bridge those tough moments. If we back up just a little bit, Matt Shingos did mm -hmm. a paper for us talking about uh, the factors which explain mm -hmm. whether or not students who show up are more likely to complete. Can you, what, what, what stuck with you from Matt's look at this? Yeah, I, one of his big takeaways was obviously that the K-12 system and the higher education system are connected. And the um, one of the biggest predictions of um, whether or not you complete is whether you're academically prepared to be there in the first place. And um, so obviously improving our K-12 system, especially for students that, um, that are kind of on the cusp is really important to getting them to then get their degree. Um, but one of the things I thought was most interesting about about it was it's not necessarily natural ability. It's not um, SAT scores that um, kind of predicts whether or not you're going to make it through college. It's more likely to be your um, grades because that actually shows that over time you've been able to apply yourself to work on something, to um, have grit to overcome uh, certain um, you know obstacles that you might have faced rather than you just showed up and you're smart and on one day you took a test. And uh, that to me then goes back to reinforcing how can we both in our K-12 system and through some of these interventions in higher ed reinforce those um, you know grittiness and growth mindset and those kind of psychological factors that might um, encourage people to persist and stick with something when it's hard mm. in you know in a way that otherwise they might not if they just feel like well I'm just not smart enough and I can't hack it right so if, so looking forward then as we think about what can policymakers do about any of this and certainly what can campus officials do yeah what what are some of the things that are percolating as you think about this yeah, I think this is, although we have a lot of bipartisan agreement and cross-partisan agreement on the problem, I think this is a place where there might be some differences in how we address <laughs> that uh, be the policy. So um, that, it will be interesting to have that conversation um, with folks that are thinking about this from a more partisan lens. Um, because I, for example, on uh, further on the left, would say that we should punish some of the schools that are doing badly, in particular the ones that are you know, pretty much wasting and misusing taxpayer dollars, where we're handing out you know 30 billion dollars in Pell and getting diddly squat back for it so um, that I think there should be some more um, looking at where are we really having bad actor institutions and and how can we get them to either improve or, or get out of the system you know the cohort default rate was supposed to be one of those things that we were gonna say well if huge portions of your students are defaulting maybe you're not doing a good job and um, we should take a look at whether you should be able to get access to student loans um, but the sheer like few number of schools that it dings at this point is just laughable because the um, there's just a big report that's uh, documented the schools are doing all kinds of things in order to game the system so they don't actually get dinged by that. And I mean, in, in one of the papers for us, uh, Mark Schneider mm -hmm. and, and Kim Clark yeah. uh, point out what, there's 600 four-year institutions where less than 33% That's right. of folks complete their degree in six years. That's right. And what folks don't always understand is when we talk about, you talk about that coin flip of completing college, yeah. you're not talking about completing in four years. That's right. We're talking about completing in six years. Why, where, where does that six year uh, focus come from? You know, I think everyone's trying to be a little bit generous to um, both the institutions and the students. And there are some who graduate in the five and the six year range. And I think we think of that as success, meaning like 
they you know it took them a little longer but they got there um, but there are a lot a lot of the new outcomes measures actually do an eight year a 200 percent um, graduation rate and what you see is between six and eight you don't get very much more right you're not having huge swaths of people that are graduating at year seven and eight um, so you know I think institutions would say, well, we have part-time students, we have students that are non-traditional students, they might need a little longer, okay, but they probably don't need twice as long. Mm -hmm. um, and what we're finding is if they're taking twice as long, they're actually not getting that degree at all. So you were just talking about, you know, one or two things that Washington might do. Mm -hmm. How about in the states? Are, are there thoughts you've I, got on that? I think a lot of the states are experimenting with things and are actually a little bit ahead of where the federal government is in terms of caring about outcomes. Likely because the you know the state policymakers have to have um, they have to have the workforce for the businesses that are there, and they know that if they're not providing um, you know a workforce that's well educated that has the credentials they need, then businesses are going to go elsewhere. So governors care a lot about this. State legislatures care a lot about this. And they've been experimenting 32 states now with different kinds of performance-based funding systems. So saying, if you're getting better outcomes, you're going to get more money. If you get worse outcomes, you'll get less money. It's a complicated concept because there's lots of reasons that you might get better or worse outcomes. So um, you know, do we need to look at what kind of students you're enrolling, what kind of institution you are, and compare you to like institutions? There have been some that have even suggested, let's do a value-added measure. Um, so we're going right back to the K-12 space. Um, let's create some super complicated formula that no one understands to calculate whether you're adding value to your students. Um, and so we, we aren't really sure if these performance-based systems are working yet. Um, some states have like 2% of their funds are allocated that way. Some it's like 70. So I think institutions are going to react differently if you're saying the dosage is 2% <laughs> versus 70%. That's probably um, a safe bet. Yeah, so there's still a lot to work out there, but there are a lot of experiments that um, we can kind of look to and gain some lessons from as we um, look to federal action that you know either might incentivize institutions through carrots or punish them through sticks. So you, you know, let's make this the last question. You mentioned a couple institutions. Um, that, that, that are doing interesting things. Mm -hmm. Is there are there one or two institutions that you think are really interesting for folks to look at mm -hmm. um, as far as learning about how these things are shaking out? Sure. Yeah, I think that um, everyone always loves to talk about Georgia State because they're doing great work and have really improved their outcomes. Um, I also think that there's uh, you know there's a lot of um, talk that should be had about the kind of higher uh, more selective institutions and the fact that they don't really take a lot of the students that we need um, them to take and so uh, they might have an easier student population to graduate they're not really doing their part and so um, you know Vassar for example has way upped its proportion of Pell students it's taking which is really helpful and you know, proportionally, it's not going to be a huge new number of Pell students, but if all of the really selectives made the attempts that Vassar has to improve by, I think, about um, 10 points, the number of Pell students that they're enrolling, that would also make a difference because there's, those institutions know how to graduate students, including low-income students. They know how to deal with academic preparation issues, and, and they, they know give how to everybody provide a the B. services. Right. right. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, um, or or they, they have the resources, and so making sure that they're actually taking some of the students that the other under-resourced schools are kind of left with otherwise is another big component. It. So I think we have to do kind of both ends of the spectrum. Uh, Lene, thanks so much for coming over. Uh, it's been a pleasure to do this work on elevating college completion with you and uh, look forward to uh, more collaboration ahead. I hope we have more partnerships. Hey everyone, that's the end of our discussion with Lene erickson Hitoski. Thanks for watching. As always, let us know what other topics you'd like AEI scholars to cover on Viewpoint and be sure to subscribe for more videos and research from AEI.